I am Doug Friedman. And I am Meredith Levy. And this is your Mental Breakdown. The podcast. Wow, we almost have that down. I know. Hi, Dougie. Hi, Mayor. You're looking very cold. Well, you're you're looking like you're prepared for the cold in your beanie and <laughs> all your layers. It's it's warmer now than it was over the weekend. The weekend was brutal. I think people more in the Northeast got it. But here, yeah, it was, I think at its peak, minus nine degrees. Wow. Wow, <laughs> think, wow, wow. Which is gnarly. I mean, even me who really likes being out in the snow and in the cold, I guess I'm still an LA boy at heart because that's, that's freaking cold. <laughs> yeah, man. It was over this last week and it got to have gotten down to like, 65, 70 here. It was real windy. So that brought in like that wind chill factor might've brought it down to like 60. Oh yeah. The wind chill brought it to minus 17 here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really funny to watch Beckett because he wants to go outside and I'll let him out. We'll run around and play for maybe two minutes and then he'll run for the door. Like he'll come back in and I've tried yeah. taking him on a couple hikes and he just looks at me like, no, <laughs> what are you doing? Absolutely and he's not. turned back and like made his way back home way ahead of me. I'm like, yeah, I get it. A throwback to your dogs and boots. He's tried the boots. He doesn't like it. I've tried like putting, there's like a, a mush thing you can put on his uh, yeah. paws. He doesn't really like that. He just licks it off. Yeah. He's just toughing it out, but pretty much runs around in the snow and loves it until he's like me going, man, this is cold. What are we doing? Yeah, I'm fine with the snow. My dad lives in Tahoe, so we go there a lot. I'm happy to go in the snow and ski. If the sun is out, maybe it's like 50 degrees, even in the 40s. Like, I'm fine with that. <laughs> like, t-shirt skiing right. weather, it's all good. I think, I don't know if I ever said this on here, but I went to Wyoming around Jackson Hole once, and it was negative 30. And wow, that was like without wind chill. And I... I'm never going back. <laughs> you could hear anytime someone opened the door, you could hear them be like, fuck, it was not fit for human consumption. And a matter of fact, my ex at the time, genius that he is, we were playing like shooting little army men with just for fun with like BB guns and he didn't have gloves on. His hands were freezing and he couldn't, we couldn't hit the oh, army, no. the army men. So we went in the garage and got off, literally got out like a sawed off shotgun and oh, <laughs> I know just for like, it, but it's up in the mountain, you know, and he shot it and he couldn't feel anything in his hands. He shot it and the whole thing like ripped his hand open and it oh, was wow. horrible. And I had to drive that motherfucker in the snow down to like the tiniest hospital you've ever seen. And I, I was like, I'm not driving in the snow. And I had to drive in the snow and I was like, this is all your fault. <laughs> wait, wait, you said my ex at the time, was he your ex at the time? No, or at no, the time no. He was your boyfriend. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. He was my boyfriend at the time. But at the hospital, he became your ex. <laughs> he did. I was like, get the fuck out of here. You idiot. <laughs> One of my buddies grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I was asking him like, okay, John, is it true? Like if you throw a pot of boiling water out and he goes, oh yeah, it just poofs. It just like kind of disappears into like, he's like, it's negative like 40 degrees or minus 40. So of course. Wait, try it. Try it there. It's probably not cold enough, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I told you the kitchen sink stopped working That's over insane. the weekend because it, it was, I guess the pipes froze. The bathroom worked. So that was fine. That's insane. On the flip side of that, I was in Palm Springs once and it was 117 a few years ago. It was so freaking hot that even though the pools weren't heated, they were literally too hot to get into. Oh, so wow. I decided to try and fry an egg on the sidewalk because I was like, you have to be able to, right? <laughs> so I go up to the restaurant and I was like, can I get a couple eggs? And they were like, sure. Went out to the, to the blacktop, like driveway, cracked the egg, just sat there nothing happened. And this security guy drives up and I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I'm going to get in trouble. And he was like, it doesn't work. But if you find a black car and you crack it on there, it'll work, but you'll fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it kind of has to get up to like 125. And I was like, okay, well, I won't be back during that time. So I remember a few years ago being out in the desert and it was, I think like 110 degrees might've been around the same time. And I was the dude that was like, cool, I want to jump in the jacuzzi and like hang out in the hot tub. 
and crank the hot tub. I loved it back then. I, I don't think it, my body can tolerate heat anymore. It's why I'll, I'll take the, well, maybe not the minus six degrees right now, but the- Yeah, it's a little much. Somewhere in between 110 and minus six, I think that'd be great. Yeah, there's got to be a good place there. Right. So what else happened? Oh, so it was Valentine's Day over the weekend, right? Right. And that's always such a interesting time of year. I mm. I have this tattoo that says love kills. Yep. And originally that was going to be the name of the Sid and Nancy movie. For some reason, just for like five, 10 years, I've just always wanted it and I never got it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to get it. So I got it. And then years later, I was like, I'm going to make that. It was just the writing. And then years later, I was like, I'm going to make that softer. So I got a heart around it and these little like and flowers. And so it really is like a dichotomy, right? It's like sort of, yeah, love kills, fuck you love. And it's also like love conquers all. It's kind of, it's both. Hmm. But I definitely, I love Valentine's Day for little kids. And I love it because I love pink and red hearts. And I love all the like <laughs> cute little stuff. And this year was the first year in quite a while that I actually had a boyfriend, Ooh. have a boyfriend. Yeah. And so it was like super fun, actually. And if I didn't, I just like go hang out with my sister and the kids. And it's like fine. I, I don't ever... Right there's all the single memes and jokes and it's funny. And I know it definitely is a hard time with a lot of pressure. And I think I like to just embrace it, not for a romantic partner, for anybody in my life. That's just like, I know it's become a hallmark holiday, but it's also just like this day of the year where we're like super focused on expressing love and like cute little love, love you things, even though, yes, of course we can do that every day of the year for sure. Sure. Yeah. For me, it's sandwiched between Kim's birthday and our anniversary, literally uh, the week before and the week after. So wow. that whole three week span that we're just in the midst of now is a really tough time for me in terms of grief coming back up. And yeah. it's not even feeling the love of Valentine's and what it means. Like it's great for many, many people and was great for me yeah. for years with her. Yeah, And now it's twinged. It's just tough. It's a tough yep. time of year, again, for me, especially with her birthday, a week later, Valentine's, a week later, our anniversary. Yeah. It's something that I think holidays hit people in all different ways. You know, there's some people yeah. that love Thanksgiving to be around family and some people that don't have family they can stand to be around or are able to be around, right? Right. And Valentine's the same. It, it, it's a love holiday, even though it's a hall hallmark holiday. It's one where yeah. you kind of go cool, but I want to spend it doing something nice for the person I love and yeah. feeling something nice from the person I love. And when yeah. you don't have that, whether it's, it's a grief thing or just, I'm not going out with somebody and that loneliness hits right. sort of the, the lonely hearts club. And, and people yeah. do, I think if you can lean into it and connect with the people around you, even if it's not your one specific Valentine totally. or whatever holiday it might be, you know, you can still connect with people and still feel yeah. that connection for lack of a better word. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. So my mom passed away right before Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving, my birthday, Christmas, New Year's, and then her birthday's in January. It's a fucking tainted bunch of months, which sucks because right. I love the holidays. But right. as time passes, it gets a little better. We'll still just be like, fuck this day. But at the same time, it's we can segue into the episode because it's it can be a celebration of life. It can be positive memories of somebody or, or not. Yeah. And I think you're right. Over time, the grief changes and there was somebody on the, I think it was our Facebook group posted something that I think we'll repost because it's, it's a beautiful illustration and I, I love that they came up with it. Well, they didn't come up with it. I love that they posted it. It's uh, if you picture again, we'll post this so you can actually visually see it, but if you're just listening, yeah, picture a square and inside the square, picture a huge circle. And the circle is grief and the square is kind of you. So there's this huge grief circle that you, you feel that you are inside on one of the inside lines of the square is a button that says pain. And when the grief is so huge, it's going to bump up against the pain button and you're going to feel the pain of grief very, very often, frequently. As time right. goes on, the circle will shrink in size. So it'll go from almost filling up the entire square and bumping the pain button all the time to being like maybe one tenth of the size of the, of the square. Right. It's still going to rattle around, 
right inside the square. And every now and then the circle is going to hit the pain button and you will feel the same amount of pain. That's why weeks ago when I said every loss that you experience is every loss that you've experienced, right? Because that pain is the same, same kind of pain. It hits the same emotion. It just doesn't do it as often as your grief kind of diminishes in size. The pain doesn't diminish. So good. Great depiction and and we'll repost it so you guys can see it. And, And thank you to Lola for putting it up there. I appreciate that. Yeah. Awesome. Let us know like how you guys feel about the cold, the heat and Valentine's day. We would love to hear about all of it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Whatever you have to sell to tell us. Yeah. We all, we all run a little hot and cold sometimes. It's true. (laughs) The light and the dark, the angel and the devil, it's all there. Speaking of all being there, Drew is talking about being there for another weekend coming up where he goes back for, I think this is the actual funeral. Before it was the service and now is the funeral, or maybe I have that backwards, but he goes back home and is dealing with what that's going to be like, what that's looking like another weekend back home and dealing with the grief. So, so this is the second weekend in a row he's going home, right? Pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. We got it. We got it. Yeah. So stick around and we will break it down for you. It's a weird feeling. I haven't really dealt with death like this. It's always been like family or people I knew, nobody like best friend status. This is the first one where I like actively worked on a relationship for a really long time. And then it's just kind of gone. It was a very present figure in your life versus somebody that's even related to you, like your cousin Mm -hmm. that was related to you that you had contact with, but wasn't around you all the time. Yeah. Right. We've been through a lot together and, the other thing that's kind of bothersome for me is people are gearing up for this weekend that didn't necessarily like him. Mm-hmm. And it's very bothersome to me because it's it's more so their own cry out for help. And so I'm trying to go about it in a vulnerable way in the sense of like still being there for those people. Why, why do you want to be there for them? I don't think they're going through what I'm going through with friend. I think that these people are going through something else in their own lives. True. Okay. Hold that. Yeah. We can come back to that. I want to keep digging on on this one thread. Okay. What are you going through with friend? Still in the it doesn't feel real phase. Yeah. There's been a couple of nights where I've cried about it, but it it still hasn't really hit me yet. I think as I'm getting really close to it, it's getting a lot more real. I mean, like even this morning, I've been grumpy all morning, kind of stayed in bed until 1130 and was just kind of not, didn't want to talk to anybody. And that's what I, that's what another worry going into this weekend. I don't want to talk to anybody. I kind of want to go through it on my own the way I usually do and, and just kind of get through it. And a lot of people have already reached out and, hey, you go in, are you going to be there? Am I going to see you? And it's more of an obligation, I feel like now, to kind of show face and be there and, and show that I was there for those people versus just me experiencing it with me and friend. And it's, it's a huge struggle for me because it's like, I can't, I feel like I'm not going to be myself when I go there now. Let's see if we can fine tune that a little bit. Because you, all the elements are there mm-hmm. that you're talking about, right. and they all will be there. And I'm hearing, I don't know mm-hmm. what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing. It's all still very new. Okay, maybe that's how you be there, not be there for everyone else. Because as you said, I just want to get through. Mm-hmm. That's a way to get through. I right. can be there for everyone else. That way, I don't have to think about me. Mm-hmm. Don't have to think about my relationship with friend, my grief, or my loss, because mm-hmm. I have a purpose now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it makes yeah. it a lot easier. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Which it, and I don't want to take that away. I do, I do. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just don't think it's the best thing for me. And I've done a lot of not bad, mm-hmm. but not the best thing for me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm really trying to figure out what that looks like and and how to go about it correctly for myself, not for other people, but for myself. You know what I mean? One of my biggest things is awareness. Yeah. So if you can have the awareness that being there for them is a tool, is a defense, it's a healthy one because it's of purpose and doing it, it's, some people say a very noble thing. Great. If we can just be aware that that's a tool and now I can use it or recognize I'm using it and pause and try to come back to being here for me, a tool, like a yeah. Swiss army knife, right? Exactly. Like, all right, let me take out the little 
saw. <laughs> never, never used. Yeah, never, never right? once. Never once. <laughs> right. But okay, let me pick that up. Mm-hmm. I can use that one. I can also put it back in and just use the knife, use the scissors. I think we can have an easier time recognizing that it's there and then choosing or just being aware of I'm going to continue to use it or let me come back to me rather than trying to eradicate that, not be there for other people because that's, it's going to turn on. Right. I guarantee you at some point you're going to have that autopilot out of body experience where you're going through motions. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you also want to go through emotions. Right. That's what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, definitely. We have plans to go out after, like, as a kind of all the boys, we're going to go to a bar after. And, and I'm excited for that to be with my boys. Right. But I don't want to take that and all of us get fucked up and not remember what just happened. And I think that's a control factor that I don't have. Meaning controlling them, controlling what happens at the bar, controlling yourself. Everything. Because, I mean, for me, I want to go and just be and, and surround myself with my like my crew and just sit and talk and, and be there. And, right. And I just don't think that's what everybody else wants to do, which is okay. But I don't want to distance myself from that crew just because I don't want to go out and drink. And I don't want to get fucked up. And I just don't trust myself, though. I think emotionally and everything tied up together. Yeah. If I go out and I, I have a drink, I'm going to get really drunk. I already know I'm going to. And so it's like, that's not what I want, but I'm trying to figure out how to be there and not be there. Well, let's kind of loosen the constraints that are on you a little bit, Mm -hmm. because I can hear you like struggling with this because I want to be at this. I want want to be that. I want it to go this way. And we can't can't control any of that. As we talked about a long time ago, the bachelor party, choice versus obligation, Mm -hmm. let you off the hook, having that compassion for yourself Mm -hmm. and going, you know what? If I get caught up in it, and I get drunk, okay. My fear that I'm not going to remember what this was. Well, after the weekend, you're going to look back at the whole weekend and remember what it was, I guarantee you. Yeah, definitely. So letting yourself off the hook in advance, because we don't know what, I mean, you might get out there, nobody wants to drink. Right. It might be, they all want to drink and you just like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. They go, okay, cool. While I'm thinking about this too, just pattern that I'm seeing too, I don't know why, and probably asterisk mom, but I feel a lot of the times when I get so worked up and then you throw alcohol in the mix, that's my like, ah, now I'm out. In the day and age that we're in, I don't, like, I don't want to be like that. I want to be able to get in front of it and not have that trigger. I, what's, the, what's the trigger? The now I'm out. What is that? I think it's down to trust. Every time I really like wanted to trust my mom and she was fucked up, it kind of just broke that for me. And so now I feel like every time I do go out and like there's alcohol or, or drugs or whatever involved, it instantly goes into the distrust and everything that happens from here on out, I don't trust. Mm, that pattern response. And it's almost, so I'm not going to do any of that because it was done to me and I experienced that and it was awful. And if I don't do it, then it almost makes it okay. Yeah. Well, it's not going to undo anything that was done in your past. That's done and that was painful. I wonder if a piece of this that's happening in this way is I don't want to do what my mom did because then it almost makes her behavior okay Mm -hmm. or at least understandable, maybe even forgivable. And I don't want to. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, I, I totally think that's true. I think I've held myself to a higher standard in that aspect of my life. I mean, I stopped drinking for like five years mm. from like when I was 18 to like 22, so four. Still weed though, right? Yeah, yeah, I've always smoked. Yeah, just not drinking. But because I didn't think she smoked. And she, I smoke with her now. She's always smoked. She's never told me. Again, just one of those things where I, I was like, oh, why, did, like, why didn't you tell me? And I think it's just such a reoccurring thing. Just across, like, as I'm thinking about it, I mean, even Bachelor Party, I said the same thing. It's like, oh, they're all going to get fucked up. I don't want to go. And then I, I think about it like here. It's like, I don't want to go to a bar because everybody's getting fucked up. And I don't trust it. It was like an epiphany of like, okay, so that's a problem, but why? And I know mom has to do something with it. I, I think it's more than that. Well, as we, as we dig and as you hear me say, like, well, maybe me being fucked up makes it okay that mom was fucked up. Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to condone it. I don't want to do it because then it makes it okay. And it's still, we're holding that it's not okay. Yeah. But, and then I go out and I do it. 
And so it's like a weird conundrum. Well, you do it and then you punish yourself for it. Yeah. You don't do it and go, yeah. I mean, the funeral, it was really tough. I went out with the boys afterwards. We all got drunk and we were all really there and we were feeling it. And, and yeah, mm-hmm. I'm not going to say it was a good time, but yeah, we were very connected. No, you'll come back going, yeah, I got fucked up. I really shouldn't have done that. And you will beat yourself up. I wonder if we can loosen that a little bit, allow yourself some of that without it being a direct correlation to mom and saying, it's okay that she did it because I'm doing it. now." Yeah. I, I think I, the, the loosening makes sense. I get that. I just don't know how. And I think this is part of the 10% of disappointment and the compassion and all of that that we've been talking about, mm-hmm. where this is like going to be an experience where I can actually put that into action. I'm just scared. It's just a scary weekend. If I get drunk, that's sort of saying to myself, wow, this emotion that's coming at me and, and this situation, it's too much. I need a defense. I need some help. I need a crutch. I'm going to drink. I'm going to disappear. Ah, fuck. This is what mom did. So if I'm doing it, I'm just as bad as mom. Yeah. And then uh-huh. the circle starts all over again. That's when I really go into that darker place because I start beating myself up. And then I haven't used and abused drugs in years, years. But last year, even, I mean, I, I did some coke here and there. And and that really brought back my addiction from previous years mm-hmm. where I saw that as an escape. Mm-hmm. And that's always scared me since that kind of happened. So I haven't touched it since because it was just scared me. How what uh, was the fear? A lot of close people have died to drugs, and I like drugs. It's one of those things where like I actually enjoy it, and like it's a fun thing for me. Which is the scary part because when I like something, I like it a lot. I'm all in or I'm all out. There is no in between, and so it's one of those things. And even with drinking, you know, like I just said, if I have one drink, I'm going to have ten. And so it's like that addiction part in my family and my life. That's what I'm afraid of of the control factor of not being able to stop, of not being able to have one drink and having water the rest of the night and being okay with that. Right. I think the other factor in that night is my own image that I feel mm. like I have to keep up with Yeah. back home because they see me as this kid in LA doing all this shit and having fun doing it. And I almost feel like I have to bring that back with me when I go. I can't go back. It's just me. And I think that's mm-hmm. another reason that I'm, this whole weekend's just kind of like, oh, fuck, like, this is a lot. Well, what's the difference there? Difference in the L.A. version that they're expecting to see or me? A lot of them I haven't seen since high school. And in high school, I partied a lot. I did a lot of drugs. I had a lot of fun. When I graduated, got my DUI, got really clean for the next couple of years, and then moved down here, doing a lot better. Right. Um, but I'm still smoking in my, my social media. It's, I'm only posting if I go to a club or if I'm going out. And other than that, you don't see my life. And so for them, they think a certain way. Glamorous, L.A., on the scene. Right. Yep. And, and I think... For me, this is an awesome opportunity for me to go back and be vulnerable and cry a little bit and show them I'm a real person. But that scares me too. Can you be both? Yeah, for sure. I don't think I've done it yet. I just kind of go on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And then you get a couple of drinks in me and then I'm full autopilot. And so I'm really trying to steer away from all of that with still being present and still having fun and, and enjoying my people, my friends. So it's all those guys that I want to go hang out with and, and just be. And, and if it, I just want to and be. And if it what? And if it, I was going to say, if it turns out to us going out to a bar and drinking, yep. like, it's okay. Yep. That, that's, and that's perfect. That's why I wanted you to complete that thought. Yeah. Smiling as you're saying that. Mm-hmm. I think partly because like, oh, shit, yeah, yeah, there you <laughs> And partly because, wait, that is okay. Right. That's hanging with my boys and that's following a natural progression when we get together. Yeah. If you were saying, look, Doug, if I have one drink, I'm going to have 10. I don't want to have 10 drinks. I don't want to do it. I've, I've had that tendency before in my life. I want to cut it off. I'm worried about this. No. Okay, that's different. Mm-hmm. I hear you guarding against something, but by virtue of going in guarded, mm-hmm. you know how you're smiling as I'm saying this, because <laughs> I think you know where I'm going. I'm going in guarded, therefore I'm already not myself. Yeah. If we do this well, mm-hmm. you might be able to drop the guard and go into it and actually not even drink. Or drink. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter because you're going in without the guard, being vulnerable, being authentic. Yeah. And the story is me being authentic, not whether or not I drank. 
Yeah, 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 definitely. You sure I'm not justifying an alcoholic? The reason I'm hesitating on that is because I don't even know how to define an alcoholic because I think I have alcoholic tendencies, but I'm not an alcoholic. Yeah, addictive tendencies. I, yeah. I, I could get into that all or nothing, right? Mm-hmm. I'm all in. Mm-hmm. Again, right? addiction. And a little bit, we'll say attachment, yeah. codependence. I think as you strengthen yourself, that authentic self, pretty much what we're talking about, yeah. that other stuff isn't as strong and it isn't the issue. It's showing up as you. Yeah, and I think uh, when I'm able to be more vulnerable and authentic, I don't have enough space for those other things. It's, it's engulfing so much of me that I don't even have that time or, or, or that need or that want or that desire, hmm. which is another reason why I want to go into this like clear mind, full heart. Can't lose, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do one of these exercises. We've done this before, sort of like, and I hate to say this about a funeral weekend, but yeah. we're going here anyway. Mm-hmm. The Disney version versus the horror story version. What would the horror story version of the weekend look like? Uh, shit. Uh, I think we're already there. <laughs> I think my horror story of this weekend would me going back and not, I want to say, feel accepted. Mm. And somewhere in that realm of things, I think that's my horror of going back and not being able to connect with anybody or be present with people. I think that's my horror. I, you know, I, he's already gone. You know, I've already seen these people in these last two months. We've already talked about it. There's nothing I could say or do. It's going to make it any worse. It's already pretty bad. I think having really serious conversations this weekend would kind of fit into that horror, horror theme. And I don't know what I'm walking into with my mom. I have no idea how she's doing right now. So I, I, I haven't even thought about that until right now. Because we're framing it in the horror story. The yeah. horror yeah. is a lot of unknown, unaccepted, mm-hmm. inauthentic. Yep. Distant. And I think for you, there, there's a big fear. Going back home, what am I going back to? Haven't seen any of them since high school. They know this picture of me. I used to party all the time, have a great time. And to a degree, I've tried to Harry Potter that photo Mm -hmm. with my social media showing like, yep, still out there, still doing my thing, still pretty cool. Yep, that's me. Mm -hmm. So that pressure of trying to maintain that. Throw into the mix, mom, Mm -hmm. how's that going to go? Another name you haven't thrown out yet, you did a week or two ago, old girlfriend. (laughs) <laughs> uh, i didn't even want to talk about it but we can since we're here uh yeah. no I, no I, I need to and so this is something i do need to talk about i'm just so fucking annoyed i am excited to go see her and i i do want her to come down and i do want all of that to be i worry that she is gonna try too hard to make me fall back in love with her but i think that's what she's doing right now maybe and that's on her yeah can you control that no nah. No, but I still feel bad. You're allowed to. Yeah. Testing your integrity and the friend you want to be Mm -hmm. is, am I leading her on? Right. Am I misleading her? Am I giving her misinformation? Mm -hmm. And at some point, we have to think about you and where your boundary is. Right. Because a lot of how we slip out of our integrity is we slip out of our boundaries. We loosen them. Mm -hmm. And then we blame the other person for pulling us out of our boundary. We didn't pull us out of our boundary. Yeah. And it happens. You're human. Mm -hmm. Especially because with with her, there's some comfort. There's familiarity. It Mm -hmm. feels nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I wanted to go into this weekend. Like, I I had this conversation with her. You know, it's like, I don't want to lean on her. I don't want to have her as my pillar in this weekend of like, oh, you're all I... I just need you. Like, it's not like that. You know, I'm going into this with my boys and like, we're going to handle it and it's going to be okay. I still want her with me. I told her that. I was like, I still want you there. I still want you present. But this isn't a me and you thing. This is a me and my boys thing. Right. And I still want you a part of it. I still want you there because I care about you. But it's not not about us. This weekend is not about us. I've voiced that to her time and time again. And it's it's just hard because it's like half of me just wants to say, okay, well, this isn't working. Like, this is too much for me right now. And the other half is like, well, if I do that, that's it. And so, yeah, that's that's me. Uh, I don't know. (laughs) It's like shrugging your shoulders, hands up. Shrugging our shoulders, hands up. That that emoji, right? It's not something you can control in terms of what she does, how she does it, if that's it. If you're saying, I need some space this weekend, 
you're not going to be a dick. Right. You're going to feel like one, but it's not accurate. When you're taking care of yourself and in that boundary, that's the strength. Yeah. And the vulnerability saying, I, I really need to be around my group, my boys. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I don't want to be around you, but at some point, if I'm feeling a lot of pressure from you, I'm going to need to distance mm-hmm. to protect my boundary. And if she has a reaction or she doesn't like it and it's, well, then that's it. Okay, then that's it. Yeah. That sucks, but we don't have control over it. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay sure. with that. Yeah, definitely. Even if she feels hurt? Yeah. Even if she doesn't like you? Yeah. I didn't do anything. None of that was on me. You did do something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Your brain right there. I saw I saw that look on your face. Yeah. Your brain's looking for, and I love, you know, <laughs> raised it that way for a purpose because you were thinking, I think. Yeah. No, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. Okay. I didn't say wrong. Yeah. I said you did do something. Yeah. Okay. Now look for it. I mean, I've been a great friend to her. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've done a lot for her in the last couple of months of let her sister stay with me, you know been there you know i make time for her to talk to her and Mm -hmm. on her schedule not mine and Mm -hmm. i do a lot for her yeah take for her out of it just what else did you do i haven't done a lot for me in this say that right so what we're talking about now yeah is you doing something for you how would you do something for you what would that be just talking about going into this weekend yeah um for you being vulnerable, being being me, you know, and going into this weekend of of actually having boundaries and being strong in those. Mm-hmm. I think that's where I slip up a lot. Go into something like, ah, here's my boundary. Oh, there they go. You know, so it's <laughs> like it's really quick. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. I mean, it, it takes a little while, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and we're we're getting there. We're walking through this. Mm-hmm. It's working a muscle. We we gotta try it, keep doing it. Yeah. You're talking about. What can I do for me? I can have my boundaries. I can be there, be vulnerable, be authentic, mm-hmm. really be me. Yeah. How is that something for her? I think to put it in short terms, you can't love somebody until you love yourself. And I, I think when I'm, when I'm helping myself, I can be more vulnerable and I can have those boundaries. And then she can understand that too. And they're on the same page and they're all good. See, that wasn't such a hard question. No. How can I be there for me, for her? Mm -hmm. And and we peel it back and the answer seems to be, I can be vulnerable, authentic, truly love myself, which gives her the opportunity to love me because she can see me as authentic. She can open up to me Mm -hmm. on her if she wants to. But the thing that I'm doing for her is being me. Yeah. And then if I don't give you that back, it's okay too. Because I knew I was the friend I wanted to be. Yeah. Where you could be there for her. You could sit next to her, hold her hand, do all this, do that for her. Mm-hmm. That's all for her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then you come back and be like, how was the weekend? You go, well, I was there, old girlfriend. Yeah. You know? and, and that's relates to what we first started talking about, about this, about being there for everyone else. Mm-hmm. But you have your own experience of this. Yeah, and I think... I think you just hit the nail on the head with that one. That's kind of been like the mindset of, okay, I, I'm there. I got you guys. Don't worry. We're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Versus, oh, I'm not really okay. Let's do this together. I'm not really okay. I need to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. Whatever that means. If that means I'm leaning on on her, great. If it means I'm with the boys, great. If that means we're going out, we're having some drinks, okay. Yeah. But I want to give myself this experience not really knowing how to make sense of this or if it's real or not real or how it feels. I mean, there's an X factor that we cannot anticipate. We can green beret it, but we cannot gear it up mm-hmm. of when I'm actually there in the moment, the emotion that's going to come up. Mm-hmm. Almost any funeral is going to hit our own anxiety about existence mm-hmm. and feelings about your family. Yeah. And I, I think the other factor in a lot of this, I don't have control over anything. Like this entire Friday through Sunday, I and even friend in general, it's been a lot of non-control. Talking to one of my best friends on Tuesday night, I was like, you got your suit ready, you're good. And so I'm making sure he's all right, helping him out, right? And uh, he's like, no, we're not wearing suits. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, this isn't a funeral funeral, it's a celebration of life, we're not wearing suits. 
And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, everybody's still supposed to wear a suit. And so, you, like, and it's a small example, but it's like one of those things where, like, could be this, could be that. And you could say that for almost anything that's about to happen. It could be this, it could be that. And I just don't know. And I won't know until I get through it. And I know next week when I see you, I'm like, oh, yeah, it was all right. We did good. We did this and that and that. And I know it's going to be okay. And I know I'm going to get through it. It's just getting there sucks. Lean into that for a second. Getting there sucks. I have a lot of time on my hands. So I think a lot. I really try to stop smoking as much as I have, which has allowed my brain to kind of open up and kind of think a lot. I don't know. I, I think it's kind of the last six months have all built up into this weekend and I, and a lot of feeling and non-control, family and old girlfriend. Everything that's been going on over the last couple of months are all kind of coming together for like this. I still feel like I'm building up for something and it's this weekend. And I hope when I can get out of this weekend, I'll just be like, ah, fuck, that was it. I'm good. And I don't know that probably won't happen, but that's yeah. what I'm hoping for. It's a lot of buildup. It's a lot of pressure. And it becomes about the buildup and the anticipation and the thing and what the thing might be. And it's not about being present for the experience at all. I'm going to throw a weird analogy at you. Do you remember the first time, or at least sex with a new partner? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. A lot of buildup. Mm -hmm. Well, with some people, right? there's the buildup of what it's going to be like. You know, and even if you're dating somebody new and you're thinking like, are we going to hook up? Mm -hmm. Are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. And how's it going to go? And I want to make sure like we're doing well and and she's having a good time too. It's something that I hear a lot of guys in here and outside of here building up for what that will be. Literal buildup. How do I control this? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I've, I've talked about this on the other side with women who feel similarly. Yeah. And one of the things that, that they look at sometimes is like, are you just present? Mm. Are we here together? Yeah. Because if they're so worried about like how they're going to perform, how it's going to go, it's not going to be as fun. I, I think that idea of build up is we're building up like, oh, it's prom night. I'm going to have sex. Like that's, that's a huge build up. I almost want to throw another one at you of uh, getting on stage. I feel like my performance was six months ago, but then it got delayed. And I was like, oh, come back next weekend. Oh, oh, one more week, come back next weekend. And then it's almost like that anxiety of just getting it over with has never passed. And I keep thinking I'm just going to wake up one morning and I'm be like, oh, yeah, I'm good. And it just hasn't happened yet. Because it really is that idea of that anticipation of the thing and, and all eyes are on me and I almost playing a character and have to be a certain way and perform and, and do all this. And, and do it well. Right. You are neither familiar nor comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. So that buildup seems like it's always there. And the thing that we get familiar and comfortable with isn't the performance on the stage, the performance in the bed. Mm-hmm. It's the actual integrity. Yeah. Your vulnerability and authenticity. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but Kobe's fall in love with the process came into mind for that. Yeah. I think my whole life I've always looked at the end goal and never looked at the process. Right. I do in work. I love my process in work. Mm-hmm. From the day I started, like ground up, I love the process in work. I hate finishing work because it's over, you know, which is really weird. It's a really trippy concept because when I get yeah. a project, I get excited to see what it is, build it, do it, go through all of that. And then when it's over and I hand it in, I almost feel like I'm missing out on something because that process is over. And I'm trying to figure out how to put that into my day-to-day life. Because if I can fall in love with my process in my life, then everything else would be perfect. Absolutely. To quote a wise man, then my days will turn into weeks, Mm -hmm. weeks turn into months, months will turn into years. Yeah, and I need to get back into that. That idea that you're talking about, that process... We get so stuck on the details of things, the content and, and what it is that we lose sight of, oh, it's, it's all of it. Mm-hmm. It's the process. It's how I'm doing this thing. Yeah. And it's not the completion of it. Mm-hmm. It's being in it. It's the journey, not the destination. All these cliches, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So for you, even just framing it as I've got this big buildup to this weekend, because this weekend is the turning in that final project, is that performance. Okay, but it's not. Yeah, and it won't be. And it won't be. 
And what's my process? Is it how I get through this weekend or how I am now and carry that forward? Hell yeah. And I, and I think the second one more so than anything. And just for example, you know, I love coming here. Mm-hmm. This allows me to kind of green bray it mm-hmm. in my weekend, like yeah. pre weekend. Right. And I love this process. Love being able to sit down and kind of figure out where my head's at and where my emotions are so I can kind of get better equipped to go into a weekend. Right. And I love that just because the weekend's over and I got my emotions out and I'm good now. I still want to be able to sit down in private friend. I still want to sit down and, and be vulnerable here and, and tell you how I'm feeling and, and what's coming and, and where I'm at. I love that process. Mm. I hate the end result here. I don't want to go to friend, you know, I just don't. Right. Uh, it's too real. I think once I'm there and I see it, it's like, oh shit, this really did happen. And me and his relationship, we would have a period where we went six months without talking and pick up like it was nothing. That happened one time, but it did happen. So I kind of feel like that's where I'm at. I'm like, oh, he's just in school. I'll see him in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think when I go home and and see all that shit, it's just going to be like, oh, he is gone. Yeah, and I'll tell you, that's something that will... We'll unpack and process. Mm-hmm. So it won't be over. Right. And I can almost guarantee it won't be real. There might be moments that will feel real, but mm-hmm. it might be more surreal. Yeah. Maybe you'll, you'll be able to connect in moments for people that seem like they're in the same place, but we don't know where you are. Yeah. In all of this, there is potentially one constant mm-hmm. in that. And it's the cliched one that I pull out every now and then, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Constant is you. And it's not about, can I project that I'm still the fun guy that goes out and parties on the LA boy? Can I be the emotional one? Can I be the the pillar that everybody leans on? Can I be the, can you just be Mm -hmm. authentic Mm -hmm. and vulnerable? And if that's my touchstone, my North Star, that's that's what grounds me, then that's how I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. And then it isn't, that event is like the mile marker and that's the thing. It's on oh no, a way. It's all this process. I'm in here getting straight with who I am, how I am, the boundaries, how I want to be, and being okay not knowing and just being present for this experience. Yeah. When the experience is over, then I'll look back. At it. Yeah, I like that a lot. I just need to go be present and then I can think about it. Yeah, all you're thinking about it leading up to, that's anxiety producing and that's, that's going to happen. And we walked through Horror Story. We didn't go through Disney version. Right. Okay, so what, what's the Disney version now? Uh, it's funny, because uh, my first thing in Disney version is my uh, me and mom, her giving me space and, mm. and, and allowing me to just be. I think that's first and foremost, because she's probably going to be the first person I see when I come home. Right. And me knowing her the way I do is she's going to want to help and be there, and just like I am. Right. How can I fix this? Yep. And by fixing it, I just need space. Yep. I'll come to her when I'm ready. Same with old girlfriend. I think that's hand in hand there. And as far as funeral, you know, I I think Disney for funeral would really just being present with my my boys. I, I think that's the best case scenario. And I actually think that's like something to look forward to. Because like in moments like this, is something we're all going to remember for the rest of our lives. And, and I think it's really important that we do. Whenever somebody passes in our friend group, it always brings us a lot closer. Yeah, it's being present. And, and that idea of, Mom giving me space. We can do that by having that boundary. Right. She might not give you space, but you can take space. Yeah. You can hold that boundary. Mm-hmm. You seem to me pretty stronger, more resolved in that now. Me too. Yeah. A year ago, fuck no. Fuck no. We didn't. We didn't have the tools. We didn't. We didn't have the experience yet. Mm-hmm. You know, you're really walking that path, and mm-hmm. it's not like I bust people on this all the time, and they go, "Well, I'm trying." I'm like, you're not trying. You're doing. Yeah. Right. You gotta do it. Yeah, and you are. And that's, that's Yoda's. Like, there's no try. There's only do. It's still going to be an emotional weekend. Might be hard. Might feel connected. Might feel dizzy. We don't know. Mm-hmm. And that unknowing is actually now okay because we can't control it. We don't control it. So don't try. I also, I think this is a great way to end this whole conversation too. I think this is the first weekend I can walk into knowing it's going to suck and not feeling overwhelmed. I think that's the biggest thing for me right now that I've, I've been thinking about that too. It's not overwhelming anymore. I know it's something that I can handle and we'll get through it. It'll be okay. Yeah. It's not overwhelming. It's just whelming. Yeah. It'll be okay.
And we are back with you. We sure are. Once again, there's a, a lot in this uh, session, so let's just jump in. He started with talking about how this is the first time going through the death of somebody that he, I think his words were he had worked hard on forming a relationship with. Right. This was somebody that was an important figure in his life and a close person that he'd worked with through the years to maintain the relationship. Right. I think what started this conversation about him being there for himself and not everyone else, he's talked about the difference between him going through it as close as he was and other people who he was like, you know, people are going who didn't even really like him. And I think there is that part of us that sometimes when someone passes, we want to, I don't know what the word is, like no judgment, but act like we knew them better than we did, or we were closer. And I don't know, just be a part of, and that that's okay. But I think, sure. and he wasn't super judgmental about that. He was just sort of stating it, but he said he, he wants to go through it on his own and not an obligation to show up for anyone else. Right. Talking about being there for everyone else allows him to take the focus off of himself and his feelings. Right. And you said something like, well, I don't want to take th that away. Right. And Drew was like, I do. <laughs> I want <laughs> right. to take it away. Like, you know, just super authentic and honest about that. And then you talked about this, and I love this analogy, the Swiss army knife, right? Where mm, yep. having the awareness that being there for them is a tool and you can take out, and Drew's like, yeah, that one that you'd never, ever use. Right. <laughs> right. And, right. and then you can take that one out and then you can switch it out when there's like a different time, you take out the different tool, different right. moments. And I think that's so true. I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's, Ultimately, you want to be there for yourself and for your own experience. And so much of Drew has been about being there for other people. That's why I think he was right. like, no, I don't want to do that. That's a way to have a healthy denial of, of what you're feeling to kind of go. Exactly. I can't feel this right now. I choose not to feel this right now. Let me pull out that other tool from the Swiss army knife and be there for others. Yeah, I think it's a necessary thing. And also for him, you know, what we talked about is realizing everybody there has their own experience. Right. That's going back to me saying everybody's the lead actor in their own movie. Like their experience is for them for the most part. Yeah. And yep. there are some people that are going to be there that want to feel more closeness than they might've had with the person or with the people around. And yeah, it's really balancing that and figuring out not just how everybody's going to be there and how, how you can be there for them. It's how you want to be there for yourself. Yeah. And I think it was interesting. You, I don't even know if this was a, a thing but you said something about going through the motions versus going through the emotions. And yeah. I was like, holy shit, that's genius. <laughs> that idea that he was talking about it really fit because it's, and him saying, yeah, I, I don't want to do that at all. I don't want to be there for them. I want to be authentic. He really wants to feel the emotions and go through it. And that's totally, that's processing grief and not everybody is going to be there. Some people won't grieve a loss until several years later sometimes. Oh, totally. Everybody grieves in different ways and recognizing they're going to be at different stages of grief. I don't think we talked about the stages of grief in the session, but there's right. the five classic stages of grief. And then it got expanded to like seven. And then I've seen like run through like as many as like 12, I think stages of grief and it goes through all this. And wow. Yeah. There isn't a, a, a blueprint for it. It's not like you pass through this, then you pass through that, then you pass through this, and then you're done. It doesn't work that way. And I think recognizing that no matter what stage of grief you're in or what where you are in the process, the person next to you might not be in the same place. And that could conflict if for you're sure. looking for that connection. And, and I think that's where when he was picking up a suit or wanting to pick up a suit for a buddy of his, and he's like, what suit? I'm not wearing a suit. He's like, what do you mean? we're all wearing suits. He's like, no, it's a celebration of life. Right. That's everybody needing to do it in their own way. And that's, again, if we can honor that everybody's going to have their own individual experience of it. Okay. We can be okay. Cause not everybody is going to share our experience of it. And that's totally. uh, something that he's going to see firsthand. I experienced that there was no need to talk about it with him during the session. But when my wife passed, we had a celebration of life and there were people that came in costume because that's how they knew Kim and, and how they wanted to celebrate her and be there. And there were people that were uh -huh. wearing all black and wanted to be yeah. feeling that and really in that emotion of it. And people needed to be however they needed to be. And I think for the most part, most people there were welcoming of that. That to me honors 
her. Like she had all these different facets to how she lived and here they all are together. That truly is a celebration of life. Totally. There was a lot of him thinking about what it means to him. And there was a, a big part of it talking about his like drinking and drugs and the past about that stuff. And so right. going out with his boys after, but he doesn't want to get super wasted, but he knows that he is going to, if he goes like one drink turns into 10 <laughs> right. and just thinking about maybe overthinking it, thinking about it so much. Yeah. And then you allowing him, reminding him he can have that space to do that if that's what ends up happening as opposed to like really overthinking it. And even if he's like got so fucked up and doesn't remember much about that night, he's still going to remember the whole point of the weekend and why he was there. Right. But I think his connection to his mom and saying, well, it's not okay for her to do it, to get fucking wasted, but why is it okay for him? And there's so many answers to that question, right? Like, because it's a very different situation. And he also mentioned he threw it out there, which I was wowed about that he stopped drinking for like five years between 18 and not that long ago. Right. I was like, wow, holy shit. And for him, a lot of this was separating out the trigger and what gets triggered right? from just the experience of what it is. Because drinking in and of itself can be fine. When it's triggering for him, it's not. And that thing of holding himself to a higher standard, if I do it myself, then I'm condoning it. And then I can't condemn it. Right. If I go out and I get totally drunk on this weekend with the boys, then it's saying it's okay for my mom to get totally drunk whenever she does it. So I can't right. be mad at her for ODing because I'm just as bad and I'm a hypocrite if I do. He said, I get pretty dark and then it's this vicious cycle where it just makes me feel worse and then I feel worse. So then I keep doing it. And that's where I'm trying to let him off the hook and, and go. Every experience of alcohol and drugs doesn't have to be a trigger for mom, you holding yourself to a higher standard. Exactly. And, that. and I'm not condoning drug use. He, I think he said later in the session, like, I like drugs. Drugs are fun. Like, I, I like doing that. Exactly. Right. But when you're triggered and when you go into that space, that headspace of holding yourself to a higher standard, feeling like you're a hypocrite and then punishing yourself, then it's no longer a fun thing. It becomes such an impactful thing for you. Right. Totally. It was interesting because he was talking about himself and sort of his LA persona. And right. he was saying he did a lot of drugs in high school and it was fun. And then he got a DUI, which I don't know if we've ever talked about. We may have. Mm -mm. Okay. And then he cleaned his sh shit up, came out here, but now his social media stuff presents this like super fun. Everything's cool up in the club. And like, so does he have to go back to back home as the LA guy or can he go back as this like vulnerable or can he be both? It's separating his authentic self and his evolving, ever changing self from an image that he projected especially on social media, we project this image of here's how we are and here's what I look like. And classically, I used to say this to kids that we worked with down in the hood in LA. Tupac is a great example of that because people think of Tupac as thug life. You know, he had that tattooed on his yeah. chest or his torso and like, yeah, from the streets and a gangster and all that. Dude right. grew up going to private school. Like he was very well educated and he chose this persona and it worked for him. And I remember right. an interview a long time ago where it was talking about how he started to believe the hype and the image that he was this thug and he started to become that. Totally. Ultimately led to his end. But I, I think it's that idea of we lose our authenticity sometimes because it might conflict with the image that we're projecting and we don't think it's okay. Right. Oh, and, and then what I did like is how you brought up going in guarded or going in authentic. And it's not about whether you drink. And then he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you said, are you sure I'm not just justifying alcoholism? Right. And that was like, it was like, oh, right. Yeah. So that was a, just like an interesting piece that you were like, oh, mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. Me saying, are you sure I'm not just justifying an alcoholic? As a therapist, and I start talking and guys, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know, I talk a lot in session. And I want to make sure that I'm not just leading them to something or that they're just agreeing with something because it makes sense intellectually. Exactly. I want to see, do they actually think this way? You know, how do they think about it? Do they feel this way? Right. 
him agreeing with me going, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And then me saying, well, are you sure I'm not just justifying an alcoholic? He paused for a second. We might have taken the pause out of the set of the episode, but right. he paused to actually think about it and says, well, I'm hesitating because I don't even know how you define that. I don't know. Maybe it's, you know, I've just got this ad addictive quality. And then he really starts thinking about it, which I think was great. So it's not just feeding him a new way of thinking and him going there. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. Got it. Right. That's not therapy. That's giving somebody a motivational talk. Yeah. I love that. How you did that. Thanks. And then the ex-girlfriend, he was like, oh, I'm kind of annoyed. I feel like she's trying too hard to get me to fall back in love. And right. And then throughout the session, there was just that theme of this weekend is not about them or about her. It's not about right. any of that. It's about him and holding the boundaries of maybe not spending time with her the weekend if it doesn't happen because he's going to focus on himself, the boys, why he's there and not her. And if she doesn't understand that, you ask, like, are you okay? If she doesn't understand, she doesn't like you anymore. He was like, yeah. Like, <laughs> right. and then at some point he said, oh, here are my boundaries. And there they go. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> right. yep, right. can so relate for sure. Right. And then you guys were talking about being there authentically as him self. Like, how can I be there for me, for her? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of spinning that. And that, that idea of the boundaries too. I, I thought when I listened back to this one, I liked looking at sometimes we'll blame people for pulling us out of our boundary. Right. And they, they don't. Yep. We're the ones that loosen our own. We're the ones that sort of flex a little bit, which is okay if we recognize that that's what we're doing. But when we totally. do that and we do that so much, and then we kind of look back and go, wait a second, hang on. I lost myself there. Where am I? Man, right. Why did they do that to me? They didn't. Totally. Yes. hundred percent. They did not actually. Yeah. So looking at how can you be there for her, for you, having that be for you. And that's, you know, kind of his old theme of it's being there for other people. That's something that I like. I'm like, okay, but right. challenging that because is that really for him or is that just what he thinks, what he's known? Yeah, absolutely. And then there was that thinking ahead about it so much the he said like the loss of control and like you said about the suit and and right. it was so much get going back to that place of it's the getting there that sucks like the anticipation is so much worse than the actual event and the build up like your sex analogy which was amazing <laughs> loved that <laughs> which is so true like you could date someone for 5 minutes or 6 months and it's still you're like okay is this going to be good is this what's it going to be like i have to make it perfect and sometimes it's like wow mm -hmm. That did not work. <laughs> right. That wasn't what I thought. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, sometimes it is. Absolutely. There can be this incredible buildup and then you get there and it's, oh my God, this is just as or even better than I thought it would be. And that excitement keeps carrying. And sometimes it doesn't. I like the sex example too, because it's something where traditionally there is such a buildup to that. And we think that that's literally and figuratively the climax of a relationship is the actual sex. Right, right, right. Let me just say for, uh, I'm sure this isn't for every girl, <laughs> almost every girl probably, but a losing your virginity, that's often something we just want to get over with. Cause it's usually not that great, which again, maybe for other people it is feel free to share with me, but meh. <laughs> well, and, and maybe, maybe what you're talking about is depending on who it's with and how it is for some people it's losing it is just get the act over with and move on right for for others it's no that this is how i want it to be and, and we curate it and this is i felt very loving right. the act itself wasn't wasn't great didn't feel good but everything around it was beautiful and wonderful so it's it's the build-up isn't to the actual act it's, it's everything around it right that's what we were kind of looking at like okay you can anticipate the thing but what about just being present for it and having it be, you know, the thing that you're, you're there for that you can be comfortable with. So it's not just the build up to, you know, your performance. And, and he mentioned being on stage, going up on a stage, there'd always be this big build up, and then you get it over with and you're like, Oh, wait, that wasn't what I thought. Yeah. A hundred percent. And at some point you said something like, I want to make sure she has a good time too. Well, boys, don't forget about that. <laughs> Talk to her, ask her. What does she like? What does she want? Just make sure. Not saying that people don't, but yeah, <laughs> on the off chance. Right. And hopefully that's what you guys are experiencing. 
guys and girls are experiencing is that people are there not just for themselves, but for you and, and for the good of everybody involved. Totally. Yeah. You guys talked about towards the end, looking at the end goal versus the process again. And like he was talking about, he loves the process. Right. And then when the process is over though, he's like, Oh, which I get, he was talking about that with his work for sure. And he was trying to figure out how to apply that to his life, because if he can fall in love with the process of his life, once again, it's the, the journey, not the destination. And he talked a lot about loving the process of therapy. And then he said like, well, I hate when it's over though. I don't want to go to this funeral. It's just too hard. I just don't want to go, which is fine. Right. And that's, and that goes back to the Swiss army knife. If you need to pull out that seldom used tool of just being in denial or not being there or compartmentalizing it, that's a way to not be there or go on autopilot, as he used to say. Totally. If that's how you need to get through the weekend, you can, you can choose that. And that's, that's sort of talking about the process and talking about being more green beret than boy scout with the gear. It's knowing that you can be there and you can be there for it. And how do you want to experience it? Maybe you don't want to have all the emotions come up at the time. Right. You just want to go through the motions of it. Okay. Recognize them and compartmentalize it. So when you come to therapy, you can open up those compartments and mentalize it. Right. That's sort of what, what he was kind of getting at. And he was just like, yeah, okay. And I think he's feeling better equipped with that Swiss army knife full of tools and, and better equipped to know, okay, yeah, I could go there and I could go and drink. And that's something that you'll probably hit. I, I asked him to, to go through the horror story version and the Disney version of the weekend. Like, what would it look like as a horror movie? Yeah. Early in the session, he was like, oh, we're already there. And then towards yeah. the end of this session, I said, you know, we never talked about the Disney version. What's that? What would that look like? Right. And just putting that in our heads to frame it that way, because with, I think, just about anything, what we're looking for, we're going to find. So if you're looking for yep. the horror version, you're going to find it somewhere. Yeah. I want to leave space for, well, what would the Disney version be? What would the happy ending be? Like, what would, what would the experience and the process be like right. if you could curate it the way you'd want to? So we can start looking for that too, because there, there will be those moments, I think. Oh, for sure. That was like, I don't know. I just li- liked a lot of, of the journey, not, you know, being present and trying to be present in The process also balancing that with there is a destination sometimes and it doesn't mean there's a destination in everything that we do. Sometimes there's not. And sometimes, you know, when there is the destination, okay, now what? Now we move on to something else and that's okay. Right. And if, if part of getting to the destination is compartmentalizing and holding things so that you don't get overwhelmed in the moment, then the now what is, okay, let me unpack that. That's what a lot of people will use therapy to unpack things, to kind of go, wait, what just happened? Now let me look at that. Right. And that's that's where I said, like, cool, that that's a way for it not to be overwhelming. It might just be whelming in the moment and (laughs) as you go through it. Right. There's a lot. Like he said, it's gonna be an emotional weekend. Yeah, of course there is. You and I didn't even talk about and seeing mom and being with family. And it's not about that either. It's about being there for his friend and being there for his own experience. Okay. So recognize all these emotions as they come up, compartmentalize them if you have to, and they will whelm you. And then you won't get overwhelmed. If you can do that, you bring it into therapy, you unpack it and, and you process it. That's the process, which I love that he loves it. Yep. hundred percent. Stick around because we will come back to process some of this stuff. And I will I will tease for you guys <laughs> that Ooh, tease away. this is, well, it, it's a good teaser and a, and a bummer of a teaser. Like it bummed me out very much that when he's home, this is when the pandemic hits. This is when it hits like full stride. Oh, right. Yeah. And then he gets back and our next couple sessions, audio gets cut off and got messed up. So we'll, we'll walk you through as much of it as we can. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll get to here, but there's the next couple sessions. I think the next two sessions will mash into one because they both got cut off and there was a lot that happened for him that you guys would not expect some you might, but it, it's, it's pretty cool. I don't mean to cliffhang you, but I'm cliffhanging you. I know such a good <laughs> cliffhanger, but you know what? That's, that's what it's about. It's awesome. Oh yeah. So stick around, come back. Hang out on the cliffs. 
<laughs> <laughs> we will see you next week. Talk to you. Okay. Bye. Bye.